What if the story you've made up about what's happening in your life is significantly determining what's happening in your life? Mm, interesting question. Well, this is Thriving in Business and Life. I'm Christopher Harding. I'm Will Wilkinson, and this is our topic for this 30-minute program. So the question you're asking, Will, if I hear you right, is what if the story that I'm making up about today or a situation is actually determining how that situation happens or plays out? Exactly. And, you know, this is early on in our book and in our online course where we propose that all of us are telling stories all the time. And we don't just mean storytelling like a raconteur, but we're making up a story about what's happening and then we forget that we did that and we think it's the truth. Yeah, so one way we describe that is that if to get a handle on, on what we're talking about is something happens, you could say the facts, right. and then we impose meaning on top of those facts. Exactly. <clears throat> the meaning is the story, is mm-hmm. what we're saying. So let, let's, let's play with an example of that. Uh, so let's say I'm flashing back to a situation I had. Uh, I had a guy that I reported to that I my story about him was that he was difficult that he didn't get what we were doing and that he was basically a a very ineffective manager well but let me guess that you felt that way or believed that you felt that way because of the proof that you saw relative to him, right? He was acting a certain way, and you determined that this is why he was doing that. Well, yeah. So the, the fact would be he would question an idea we had and challenge it. Right. And we were very excited about the idea. Uh-huh. And so we thought he was a killjoy. Exactly. Right. right. That right. was the story we made up. Yeah. The, the fact was he questioned that The story we made up, he was a killjoy. So we went about going to battle with him. Mm-hmm. We went about talking behind his back. Mm-hmm. We we went about looking for evidence mm-hmm. without even realizing it mm-hmm. to confirm that our belief about him was, was correct. Mm-hmm. So and you kept seeing more evidence that you were right. Oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that, that, you know, you can just think of all the other places in your life. What is the story I've made up about a particular person and therefore, I approach them and interact with them as if it was true. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that the person is difficult or bad. It could be that they're awesome. Well, this gets into Module 2 in our, our program. I forget what chapter in our book about bias, right? Right, Because right. we have a bias about someone, and then we keep seeing that bias reinforced. Yeah. But, you know, our question today is, is there an objective reality that we're observing and not having any influence on it, or is the way we look at things actually changing what we see, right? Yeah, and change, therefore changing how we show up. Are we are right. we almost, you know, manipulating reality mm-hmm. to turn out the way we expected it to? Mm-hmm. Are we setting ourselves up or setting someone else up? And are we disappointed when they don't live up to our, or live down to our expectations? Yeah, I mean, it becomes self-reinforcing, you right. know, like a loop. I, I'm remembering, and I think I've mentioned this example once or twice before, but, you know, the therapist who's dealing with his husband who's really having trouble with his wife. She's got a short temper. Right, right. And uh, she, he goes on, the patient goes on describing his wife, saying, yeah, she's got such a short fuse, and she's blowing up all the time, and it's just, she's so easy to trigger, and what do I do? And the therapist said, oh, I understand your problem. You think your wife is a bomb. Right, right. And this speaks to our point. The husband was viewing his wife as an explosive person, and he could prove it because she behaved a certain way. But the overlay of his story, what he was making up about her, it was more than just this is her consistent behavior. It was identifying her, just like you identified this fellow as a killjoy. That's going beyond the behaviors. That's now become an identity. And when we identify someone, and this, of course, is a current issue politically and, you know, all over the world, people identifying others, pigeonholing them, and then believing they're all the same. Well, and it's, it's uh, you know, 
as you said, pigeonholing somebody or basically stereotyping someone, uh, basically trying to dehumanize them. We reduce them down to a single characteristic and ignore all evidence to the contrary. And and life is just simply more complex than that. Human beings are much more complex than that. So the question is, you know, well, why should I care whether my story is impacting the outcome if I'm happy with my story and I feel good about proving myself right for example in my case years ago that my boss was a a difficult you know jerk uh, and I felt kind of righteous about it and Mm -hmm. you know was able to go around and, and prove myself right what would be the possible reason to even examine my story or care well, I think one easy answer is because there's a lot of implications and repercussions to running a story like that that requires you to filter out any evidence that would dispute your story. I mean, an example, this is true, I've got the details uh, a little wrong, but a vigilante uh, driver who took upon himself to police the roadways. And he would challenge any other driver who was driving excessively fast or swerving around. Oh, my. And, uh, you know, he was policing the roadways. And he tells the story of encountering this guy driving out of control and how he almost forced him off the road to stop him and discovered the guy was taking his wife to emergency because she was having their child. Yeah. That's why he was driving faster. And I remember reading the story and the guy was so mollified because his story was that anybody on the road who's driving differently than I think they should is a menace and I've got to get him off the road. He couldn't see. He was filtering out other evidence that would have alerted him to what was actually going on. That's a way to answer your question. That's the danger of blinding ourselves with a story we think is the truth. Well, the other part that seems to be ironic and, uh, you know, evidenced in his his behavior is that he was becoming a menace on the road. That's exactly right. And I believe, if I remember the story, he came to see that. The very thing he was against, he had become. (laughs) Yeah, that is. That's beautiful uh, irony. You know, oh, that we could have more of those realizations for ourselves. Well, it's like, you know, the activist who's against abortion, who shoots a doctor who performs abortion. He's against murder, so he becomes a murderer. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, so many instances of that. So, <clears throat> you know, taking it down to, to the everyday situations in life, sometimes it seems, I know for me, that I only start questioning my story if the actual repercussions <laughs> start to become yeah. present enough. <laughs> it gets your attention. That it gets my attention, right. right. We usually need that. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, in the case I was giving, when I ended up on probation for insubordination. Mm. <laughs> that got your attention. Well, it got my attention. First of all, I, it, I thought it was proving me right. Uh-huh. But I had somebody ask me the, the question of, had this ever happened before in my not life? Not that I'd been on probation for insubordination, but had I ever had difficulty with other people I considered to be difficult? Right. And, and you know, the, the obvious correlation that was made was I was the common denominator in all of those situations. You, you were there in every situation. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> so it really started to invite me to, you know, ask the question, because I had never honestly considered this before, was my view of it, yeah. as we call it, the story. I was, uh-huh. you know, running about it. Was my story what was actually impacting the outcome and helping to create the circumstance that I found myself in? Well, you know, I, I remember hearing a story about someone moving to a new town, and he's in the coffee shop, and he asks somebody there, he says, well, uh, what are the people like in this town? I, I just moved here. And this guy sitting next to him said, well, what were they like where you lived before? The guy said, oh, they were pretty grumpy. And he said, well, you'll probably find them grumpy here, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. My grandpa's favorite story. That Is he, it? That, yeah. That he would tell me regularly. <laughs> Uh, because I think, you know, he wanted to make the point, though clearly it didn't sink in because it was years <laughs> later when I had that, <laughs> that uh, experience with the, the boss that was really a turning point in my life where I started to consider for the first time, quite mm-hmm. honestly, that my view of a person, my view of a situation, 
impacted at the very least my experience of the facts mm -hmm. my experience right. of the situation yeah and therefore how i responded and whether i you know fueled mm -hmm. that dynamic mm -hmm. or whether i started to create a different dynamic well, you know, we're massaging this pretty well here, and this we could go on at length about this. It's too bad we don't have a call-in on our show, because it'd be great to get some listeners' responses to this. But I'm kind of getting to another question, which is, what do we do about it? Now, you know, we could argue about that. Whose story is right? Do we compare stories and dissect them? But, you know, it occurs to me, and I'm, I'm always um, saddened when I see the news and people are arguing and so polarized, that we fail to try one very simple tactic, which is to abandon our stories for a moment, just to let go of them, and instead focus on the result we want. Right. Okay? Because often we can agree on the result. We just have different stories about why things are the way they are and how we could get to that result. But if we started with the result and realized that we all kind of agree on most things... That would make it easier to adjust our stories. Well, so we use this a lot in coaching, right? We use it a lot uh, in some of the training we do as well and consulting. And it's, uh, you know, looking at the state of mind diagram, right? right? If you go from left to right, there's the mindset, the story, the beliefs in one box. Our actions or behaviors in the middle box. And the result is is the box on the on the far right. So... With that being the case, if we get clear on the result, yeah. with or without anybody else's participation in it, just, mm -hmm. hey, I, des I decided I want to have a great relationship mm -hmm. with my boss. Mm -hmm. I want to see his humanity. Mm -hmm. I want to see uh, how he and I can work together. Mm -hmm. What story would I have to make up about him and about what's possible mm -hmm. in order to get that? That's kind of what you're driving at. Yeah, right? well, you, and then you, what would I then do right, or you, not do? You then feel free to choose a different story because right. it's in service to an end a result that you want to achieve. Yeah, it's, it's recognizing that, that if we're aiming for a result, to your point, then we have to align our mindset and our story in such a way that it will naturally lead to that outcome. Yeah. I thought of an interesting way of uh, communicating this this morning. Tuesday mornings, we record this podcast, but before that, we go to our breakfast meeting with about a dozen friends, business friends, always a stimulating conversation. This right, morning, it was right. a little polarized with some strong views coming out on, what was it, climate change and, and health care. Health care, you know, people with their stories, which they back up with all kinds of proof. But I was thinking about this very topic, which probably is why we're talking about it on the, on the podcast. But I was remembering William Deming, who was an American statistician who really rose to prominence in uh, post-war Japan, because his ideas were rejected in America. Right. And I think one of the top business awards in Japan is the Deming Award. Right. But I remember a little experiment he talked about in, in a book where you hold a ball bearing over a desk and you put an X on the desk and you drop it. And if it lands to the left or the right, what do you do next? It was very interesting because I fell for it, just like most readers would. Well, if it fell to the left, move it over to the right and drop it from a different place. And he said, no. No. You don't have enough proof yet. You're, you're concluding that the reason it dropped to the left of the X is because of where you held it. There could be 16 other reasons why. Maybe there's a strong wind blowing. Maybe the table is slanted. Maybe, and he reeled off a number of these. He said, no, drop it ten times from the same position. If it lands in the same spot every time, you could then more safely conclude that your experiment validated your conclusion that you should move your hand and drop it from a different place. Now, I read that like 30 years ago. I've never forgotten it because our inclination is to jump to a conclusion based on too little evidence. Well, and so here's here's the, let's let's take that because that that's a beautiful illustration of what works with inanimate objects, right? True. So now, I had, I'm going to guess I had thirty to fifty examples of mm -hmm. evidence I mm -hmm. I had accumulated about mm -hmm. this boss, mm -hmm. but I was wearing a filter. 
Mm -hmm. through which I was seeing everything. So I was filtering out, you were talking about the driver, I was filtering out a ton of information that would have been contrary to my view. So there's an an exercise we've done. Well, just let me interject here, because my experience of that, I'm totally agreeing with you, is is standing in water. You know, you're wading in water and you have a stick in the water. Right. When you right. look at it, it's in a different place underwater. Yeah. There's a filtering that goes on, so you're seeing it over there. It's actually over here, which is created by the filter of the way you're seeing it, the, right. the water and so forth. Yeah, the refracted it, light. Yeah, it's refracted. Yeah. It's not really there. Yeah. Well, and it, so one of the things we've done in in organizations where you have two people who are having different points of view or two um Departments, perhaps, that are having different points of view, and they have stories about each other. So, first of all, we ask them to identify what's the story. Mm-hmm. What's the story they currently have that they have validated through their repeated experience? Now, now talk a little bit about how difficult that is, because I'm sure some people may be able to do that readily, but my experience is some people really resist even that step. All you have to do is say, T- tell me your experience of that person or group. Mm. Mm-hmm. And they list off all these things. Yeah. Okay, that's their story. That's what uh, they've been filtering right. for, right? Their story is their experience. Right. Then how are you responding to it? How are you showing up? What's mm-hmm. been the result so far, right? Mm-hmm. You get both of them looking mm-hmm. at that, and they can see, well, wow, we're creating this together mm-hmm. based on our mindset about mm-hmm. each other. So uh, then what we do is we have each party tell the other party their point of view, why they've been showing up the way they have, what their concerns are, what mm-hmm. their what the result is they're aiming for, and the other party has to listen to it and then make the case back to them why that makes sense. Interesting. And they have to do it with each other, yeah. right? So that's they have a great to, technique. Yeah, they have to take the what had been up to that point the opposing point mm-hmm. of view. Mm-hmm. What I've never seen it not happen mm-hmm. that if they really engage in that. Suddenly, they rehumanize each other. Mm -hmm. They understand each other's concerns. Mm -hmm. They are able to drop their stories and create a joint story together Mm -hmm. about how they can solve this situation together and create, as you were talking about, a result that they both want. Well, what leaps out to me in this, I'd love to dig into a little more, is the whole uh, humanizing aspect. Right. Because I think argument, polarized viewpoints, pigeonholing people, etc., it all contributes to a dehumanization that creates the other. Right. Those who are not like us, who we can demonize and blame. You know, the whole immigrant thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what is an immigrant? Are all immigrants the same? No, they're human beings who may happen to be immigrants. So there's a strong tendency in our, really, our global culture today to dehumanize others by pigeonholing them and thinking they're all the same. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah. So again, we're talking about stories. So what if the story I make up about somebody, right, actually impacts how they show up? So, Mm -hmm. you know, let's say that I believe, and I see this happen, by the way, in, in corporations. Sometimes we get called in to figure out why they're losing a certain portion of their workforce who comes in, doesn't succeed, leaves, goes somewhere else, and becomes highly successful. Right. And so, so what made the difference? Well, yeah. So at a certain point, they start saying, "Okay, I wonder if we had something to do with that." <laughs> <laughs> That's a big moment, right? So a big epiphany. If this unconscious story, and this is the point I don't think we've made yet, is most of these stories are running unconsciously. Yeah. yeah. They're such assumed truths in our minds mm-hmm. that we don't even question the reality. The it's lens. just automatic. Yeah, it's just the lens, it. the lens yeah. we're looking through. So let's say somebody comes into the organization, and I have an unconscious notion or belief or story that they're just not really going to quite fit in, or mm-hmm. they're not quite up to the task. And this might be because of what? The way they look, prior experience with them? Prior experience with people like them. Yeah. Prior experience, you know, social stereotypes, right. and we, you know, we we're, were talking about bias before. So biases filter into yeah. our stories. So now, let's say I don't believe you quite have the real capability. Mm-hmm. You know, when it comes to growth opportunities, I'll probably give you smaller ones. Exactly. Might not give you any. Might just keep you focused on a task. Yeah. 
when it comes to the subtle coaching of how I pull somebody aside that I believe in mm -hmm. and I show them the ropes mm -hmm. and I, I help them correct themselves and I catch them doing it right, mm -hmm. if I don't believe in you, mm -hmm. if I've written you off, mm -hmm. I don't do those things. Well, let's talk about why that behavior is happening. I mean, I know the answer, but I'm curious. Why do you think that's going on? Well, why, you know, if I don't believe you've got it, why would I invest in it? Well, and why right. would I take a chance on you screwing up? Right. But the, the kind of the deeper motivation I'm thinking of is that we all like to be right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I want to prove I'm right. And if I judge you and think, well, you know, Chris isn't up to this job, I'm going to filter to prove that I'm right. Yeah. So that at some point I can go, I was right to think Chris isn't up to this job. See, he's just proven he's failed. Not realizing that mostly unconsciously, sometimes consciously as well, I'm feeding this situation yes. to produce the result that I've predetermined. And then I can say, see, uh, I was right. I well, was right. yeah. We like to be right. We could, yeah, the, we, we sometimes say the need to be right supersedes our willingness to create a, a real solution. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And it's also, you know, I hear this come up a lot in conversations when we're dealing with this with clients is they realize they've been creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And and the interesting piece is, so now let's let's flip it, look at the person on the other side. They're coming in and probably experiencing right away that this person doesn't believe in them. Yeah. They see other people getting yeah. opportunities they're Why not. Why am I being treated uh, differently? Right. Yeah. And so now, unless they're really aware mm. and are able to navigate that terrain in a way that most of us typically aren't equipped to do, they will start to react in mm. in defensive ways or mm. overcompensating ways. Yeah. And because the other person is seeing them through that yeah. lens... Yeah, which escalates everything. Yeah. And all yeah. of a sudden, they're caught in this yeah. loop. Suddenly you've got a thing. Yeah. It's become a thing. And it's, like you said, it's, it's self-reinforcing. It's a yeah. self-reinforcing loop. Well, we like to give our listeners a chance to try this stuff out and, and create a little simulation each week. So let's do that um, and just invite listeners to imagine, pick something. Uh, I was just wondering how to phrase this. How do you kind of identify a story? Well, you already tipped us off to this. Just look at your experience. Yeah, one way to say it is, is uh, you know, think of a situation where you're experiencing less than satisfactory right. dynamic or results, where maybe you're frustrated with a situation, maybe it's you're embarrassed, uh, you know, whatever it might be, and just realize what that situation is and then ask yourself if I really looked at it what's the story I'm making up about the situation the person or myself and the story is going to be laden with bias right filters ways I'm seeing the situation I maybe even I'm not conscious that I've laid that filter almost like you know if you were glasses, sunglasses, it's going to seem dimmer. Well, and, and I will have accumulated evidence. I can prove it. <laughs> to prove myself correct. Okay, so imagine, this is what we call our thriving simulation. Imagine, just for a moment, what it would be like if you just stop telling that particular story. You made up a different story, and you make it up based on the new result that you want. So start there. What is the new result you want? Right. So what outcome would you really like to be experiencing in that situation or with that person? Yeah, I sometimes suggest this is where you get the magic wand. And, you know, using your imagination, we call this imagifying. Your <laughs> right, life. right. Using your imagination to create something with no limitations. You know, think big. Yeah, and then, you know, it's, it's, so, sometimes it, it, it is even simple. It's like, I really would just like to be able to go in and enjoy working with this person. I'd like to have it free of conflict. Now, this is where, you know, we call this sometimes a game challenge. This whole, whole thriving program is really a, what we call a full immersion game. You play in your life. You don't take time right. off from your life. You play it in your life. There's a real challenge here because, you know, our minds can get busy and offer all kinds of reasons why this isn't going to work. And get all logical about how, you know, this is never going to succeed. So... Just abandon that for the sake of this little simulation. Yeah, it's it's a game. It's, it's a, a game. game. So so it's almost like if you think of it as a game, is is okay. I, I'm going to see 
I'm just going to see if if somehow I can conjure up this result, you know, and bring it into reality. So you've identified the result. Now go back. Remember, we talked about those three boxes. Go back to your story or your mindset and say, what's a new story I would make up about this situation or person if I really wanted the result? What's the story or mindset that would naturally lead to creating that outcome? You know, interestingly, this is the technique writers use, fiction writers particularly. They know the end before they write the rest of it. Because once you know the end, you can write your way there. Similarly, you know, in the story of our lives, if we know where we want to go, we can navigate to get there. Yeah, and that brings us to that middle box. What do I do about it? Right. The middle box is behavior. What do I say? What do I not say? Mm-hmm. What do I? How do I act? How do I not act? Mm-hmm. You know, and... With the result in mind, yeah. right? And this is where you start to have fun because initially just know that the person is going to do things or say things that are going to trigger your old story. Yeah. And when they happen, what we like to suggest is just smile and go, right. oh, wow, there's a trigger. Yeah. All right. So what's the result I want? What's the story I'm, I'm running here? Mm-hmm. All right. So how would I show up? And yeah. Initially, when we start to change our behavior, what's kind of fun or funny uh, or challenging, as the case may be, is sometimes it throws the other person off. Because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're acting differently. <laughs> they they can depend on you to act a different way, usually, and now you're acting, whoa, what's this? Yeah, you were, you were doing the cha-cha together, and now you're doing the foxtrot, and they can't, they're like, I, I don't know the steps to that dance, right? So, just to break it down, now we're moving into part three of our three-phase thriving learning system to, to do it, to practice it. Um, you know, this week, we do have some loyal listeners, so they listen every week, so between now and the next podcast, we'd like you to pick something as we've been suggesting, troublesome area where you're not happy with the experience you're getting, and use this little formula. Identify the experience you would like to have. And then, what's the story I'd need to tell? How, what would I need to make up to contribute to getting that result? And now, what would I need to do to right. get that result? Exactly. And then track what happens. Yeah, and as we've always said, it works even better if you have a co-conspirator. So have a friend that yeah. you tell, hey, this is a game I'm playing this week. I want to be able to keep track of you. And your your aim as my game you know, co-conspirator is to keep me on track with my new story. So explain that a little more. We've got another couple of minutes here. How would that actually work? So what would you invite them to do and what might they do? So what I would say is, hey, here's been my experience. In this specific situation. Yeah, in this so specific. You're, you're telling them what's going on. Yeah, here's yeah. what's been going on. Here's the result I've been getting. Here's yeah. what I've been doing and the story I've been telling. Right. Here's the new result I'm I'm you know, looking to create. Here's the new story I'm going to generate about it. Here's what I'm going to do. If you happen to be working with me, then you can see me and say, you can pull me aside and say, hey, you're falling back into your old role, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or if we don't work together, I can come and talk to you on the phone or in person and go, hey, here's what happened today. And your job is to say, wow, way to go. Sounds like you're on the right track. Or, ooh, looks like you're slipping back into your old role. It creates accountability yeah. and awareness, yeah. right? And win or lose, you know, whether we do this perfectly or stumble at it, there's learning to be had. Well, and the main thing is, is to recognize is the other person may or may not change. Mm-hmm. But the one thing we are in charge of is our experience of that situation. Well, what a great person. point that is, because this isn't really about um, using some technique to get somebody else to be different. This is all about ourselves. Right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're basically saying we can change the experience of how we experience others and life. And, oh, it just so happens that a lot of times when we do, we get to see the magic of what happens when we free somebody up from the box we've put them in. Well, the implications of this, Chris, are just immense, uh, and we'll go on exploring deeper. Our, our question today has been, and we have phrased it as a question which we have explored, is does the story that I'm making up have any significant influence on the experience that I'm having? Yeah. And we're saying, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And as a matter of fact, we've got a free video online 
that you can access. It's called Creating Stories to Generate Success. If you want to watch that video, just email us at thrivinginbusinessandlife at gmail.com. We'll send you a link, absolutely no obligation, and you'll have fun with it. It's basically set up as a game. We'd love to hear feedback from you. So I'm Christopher Harding. And I'm Will Wilkinson. And this has been Thriving in Business and Life. We'll talk to you again next week.